Well, welcome, welcome to Capital City again. We're so glad to be together today. Welcome to part three of uh, our series, God and Sex. If you haven't been with us for the past couple of weeks, I want to encourage you to get online and uh, to make sure that you catch up to where we are so that you don't miss anything. I want to start off today by sharing a, what I want to call a common paradigm that you see in popular culture as it relates to sex and sexuality. And I've chosen two examples from popular culture to television shows that I hope are appropriate in shared company, but also familiar to a wide age range of people today. If you have made good life decisions, these shows may only be vaguely familiar to you, okay? But I have to admit, I have not, I have not always made good life decisions 100% of the time, and so I have seen episodes of both of these shows. I will confess that up front to you today, um, but I want to I share these, uh, these two examples with you. The first that I want to share with you is a show called Grey's Anatomy. Anybody watch Grey's Anatomy? Okay? Anybody want to admit it now that I've introduced it this way? Grey's Anatomy. Uh, I don't know if Grey's Anatomy is a show, a, a medical show on, on, uh, on television. I don't know. Maybe for you, this is what inspired you to get into medicine. Maybe, that's, maybe that is what this is. But Grey's Anatomy, I think, teaches us a lot about culture's view on sex and sexuality. So what can we learn from the show Grey's Anatomy? Well, first, we learn that Seattle is a very dangerous place to live. Don't ever move there. Okay? Unparalleled rates of like natural disasters and emergencies, so don't ever live in Seattle. But one of the things that I think that you learn when you watch this show is that hospitals are a place either to have sex or to die. That's basically it when you, when you watch this show. And, uh, and when you look at this show, you, you ask the question, okay, so what, what is the view on sex? What's sex for in the world of Grey's Anatomy? Well, here's a couple things that you learn. Number one, you learn that sex, the sexual desire is an uncontrollable tsunami that must be dealt with immediately, preferably in an on-call room, okay? Secondly, we learn that it is difficult to control this tsunami in a long-term committed relationship because there's all of these shiny people in which you can choose from to sleep with. So why have a long-term committed relationship when you have all of these shiny people all around that you can, you can sleep with? And thirdly, we learned that sex is always fun, always pleasurable, always refreshing, and it rarely has any long-term consequences. Have you ever noticed how much airtime the children get on these shows like zero because there's no long-term consequences to the the fun of sex this is what we what we learn from a very popular show that that um has been running for for many many years Here, here's the second illustration that i want to give you a, a little show called the bachelor anybody Nobody wants to admit this one. All right, some of you. Some of you might. The Bachelor. Again, if you've made good life choices, you have no idea the premise of the show. But let me give you the premise of this show. An eligible Bachelor on screen begins with dating around 30 women and then slowly eliminates a few at a time. And then they get down to three women, and then two women, and then one woman. And with that one woman, he's supposed to propose, and they date for a few months, and then they break up. That's, that's The Bachelor. You're not missing anything. Now, late in the season, they have, uh, when The Bachelor has weeded it down to three women, they have what is called the Fantasy Suite episode, okay? Let me explain to you the Fantasy Suite episode. It goes something like this. Every single one of them is identical to what I'm about to tell you, okay? Number one, there is a profession of love. Oh, I love you so much. Number two, there are fireworks, literal fireworks going off behind them, in a date. Number three, there is a hot tub and some steamy makeout session. And then number four, there's the implication that the couple has gone into a room where they have had sex. It's nothing explicit, right? They don't show anything, but it's like a door slowly closes as the camera backs out, right? And then the next shot the next morning is like a pan or panning shot of like a floor with some clothes scattered all over the floor. That's every single fantasy suite, fantasy suite episode. So the fantasy suite is where the bachelor, not just with one woman, but with three, gets to try them out. Gets to try out which one he likes best which one he might want to marry and again nothing explicit but the producers make sure that we believe that sex has occurred and all three dates they seem very romantic 
But we have to pause and remember there are three women, not just one. Because the very next morning, one woman who had this experience the night before gets told, hey, thanks for being on the show. See you later. You got to go home. Not the fantasy. Not the fantasy. And the logic here, as, as you watch The Bachelor, the logic is that the fantasy suite is a place to test your connection with the remaining women. Take the car for a test drive, sleep with three women, pick which one you like the best, then date her for a while until you break up because now you have an invitation to be on Dancing with the Stars. That's essentially what, that's essentially what The Bachelor is. So the, these paradigms of popular culture as it relates to sex and sexuality illustrate for, for, for us what I like to call the consumerist paradigm. The consumerist paradigm of sexuality, where reality revolves around the autonomous self. Sex is about consumerism. What can I get? What do I want? What can I do? But we all know deep down that people are not products to consume for our own enjoyment as much as culture wants to convince us of this. But it's a paradigm that we see everywhere we look in popular culture. In this series, we are asking a very, very specific question, and it's this. <clears throat> Does the Christian sexual ethic still matter for the 21st century? And today what I want to do is I want to focus, and we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. Again, if you've missed any, please go back and kind of catch up to where we are. But what I want to focus on today is I want to focus on the unique perspective of the Christian sexual ethic in its belief that sex is designed only for the context of marriage. Sex is designed only for the context of marriage. In the framework of the Christian sexual ethic, the only relational container strong enough to hold the nuclear power of sex is a lifelong till death do us part covenant of marriage. Now, the question is, where does that idea come from? And why would this be the teaching of Christianity? We're going to explore this concept a little bit today. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, in a little bit here in just a few moments. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But to build off of the biblical story that we kind of laid the foundation for last week, um, I want to begin by reading a quote from a, a great uh, preacher and author who um, actually this past year just recently passed away. His name is Timothy Keller. Timothy Keller wrote an incredible book called The Meaning of Marriage. I would highly, highly recommend this book. But in this book, here's what he says. Sex is God's appointed way for two people to reciprocally say to one another, I belong completely, permanently, and exclusively to you. Now, this is a very big claim to make. And so we need to step back and see why and how the Bible arrives at this conclusion. And I think we ought to start with Jesus. So before we get to 1 Corinthians, let me remind you of something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. We've looked at these verses in this series already, but they're so foundational for the Christian sexual ethic. In Matthew 19, Jesus was asked a question about marriage and relationship, and Jesus quotes from Genesis when he responds to this answer to the religious leaders. I'll, I'll throw these verses on screen really quickly again. This is just review. Genesis 1:27. Jesus said, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So as he's answering a question about marriage and the marriage union, he goes back to Genesis and talks about anthropology. He goes back and talks about how we were designed and created in God's image as male and female. And then he quotes from Genesis 2:24, which says, this is why... A man leaves his father and his mother and is united, united to his wife. And as we said in week one, not united to his girlfriend, not united to his Tinder date, not united to anyone else, united to his wife, and they will become echad. We talked about that word last week. They will become one flesh. Now, what Jesus is highlighting here is the Christian worldview of how we are created as man and woman, and that God has intentionally sexually differentiated us as male and female, and this differentiation is foundational to who we are as image bearers. Now, of course, there are many other significant differences that exist between men and women, and the interplay of those differences are enriching as well, and they're great to talk about, but none of those differences are as defining in the scripture as the difference between male and female. Okay, notice Genesis 1 does not say God created them introvert and extrovert. 
right? Genesis 1 doesn't say God created them left brain and right brain. No, God created them male and female. And that distinction has uniquely enriching potential for us. And that distinction is alone the distinction which can create the possibility of two becoming one flesh. And so Jesus goes back all the way to the foundational understanding that, the, that it is essential for us to understand how the interplay between male and female is the foundational Christian understanding of sexual ethics. Now, within this one flesh male-female union, we learn some very important things about what sex is meant to be for the marriage and within the marriage context. And the first thing that we learn in scripture is this, that sex is to be a means of self-giving. If we lay this in contrast with our culture's consumerist mentality when it comes to sex and sexuality, this stands in stark contrast. Look with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, the apostle Paul is writing into uh, his day and age in the first century, the people in Corinth, about their marriages. And he speaks about the husband and wife. Look what he says. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. He goes on in verse 4 and says the wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Now, again, in contrast to the consumerist paradigm that we see all throughout our culture, Paul counsels both the husband and the wife to be completely self-giving in their sex life. In this mutuality, Paul speaks of sexually serving your spouse. He doesn't write that each partner is to take their marital right from one another, but that each person is to give to one another what is their right. And so when we step back and we look at this kind of picture of sexuality through the lens of the Christian ethic, it's easy to conclude that if we reduce sex to just a means of getting what I want, just a means of pleasure, it is actually holding back from somebody what is meant to be a complete, permanent, and exclusive form of self-giving, is what Paul is saying. Now, having made his point in the positive, Paul then in the next verse makes the same point, he just makes it in the negative. Look at verse 5. He says this, husbands and wives, those of you who are married, do not deprive each other. Okay? Don't, don't, don't freeze one another out of, uh, uh, of sexual activity. Except perhaps, here's, here's the exception, by mutual consent. Okay? Mutual consent takes two people, not just one making a decision that we're not going to have sex anymore. It, it is two people saying, mutually, we're going to pause for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So here in the negative, Paul says that fulfilling your marital duty to your spouse is so important, and Paul actually forbids couples from depriving one another. And he can only envision that a couple stops having sex only temporarily and only through mutual consent and only for a season of prayer. And beyond that, the couple will be in spiritual danger if they are not connected sexually. Because again, being connected sexually is far more than something that is just physical. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, uh, also in verse 5, I find this very, very fascinating. You can take this for what it's worth. I find it fascinating that the only person who is against, who is against sex in the context of marriage is Satan. The only person. So we see that sex is a means of self-giving, and it is designed for the context of marriage. Now, not only do we see it as a means of self-giving, but secondly, we see sex as a means of giving the entire self. And when I say the entire self, I mean more than physical. Sexual union is both the expression of and a vehicle for a wider and deeper form of union. Because sex is a means by which two people are united, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually and psychologically. Last week, we called these soul ties. You tie your soul to the person that you 
sleep with. And our culture wants to claim that you can give somebody your physical body without giving them your whole self. But the sexual ethic says that's not possible. And in fact, people today who are longing for a different and a better story are recognizing that it is not possible either. Paul shows us this way, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. He uses these words, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Notice what Paul is saying about sex. What we do sexually affects our entire being in a way that is not generally true of other things. Sex engages far more than just our body parts. It involves the whole person. And this is a positive truth about sex. And it's a beautiful thing when it is done within the right context. But we can also communicate this in a negative view. Because I think maybe even in the negative, it's more powerful. Because we already know this. When somebody is wrong sexually... When somebody in our culture is sexually assaulted or, or somebody in our culture is raped, we know it is more than just a couple of body parts that are hurt. The entire self is damaged. The entire person is violated. And it is so paradoxical because we live in a hookup culture that is trying to be in complete, total denial of this even though they know they can't be. And it's so, so vital. Timothy Keller, he goes on in his book, The Meaning of Marriage. He says this, every sex act is supposed to be a uniting act. Paul insists it is radically, listen to this, it is radically dissonant to give your body to someone whom you will not commit your whole life. It's actually against something that is deep down in our soul. In other words, having sex with somebody without the intention of giving them your whole self is actually a form of taking. It is theft. And it is what is at the heart of the consumerist paradigm of sex and sexuality. Let me give you an analogy that I hope would be helpful. I read this um, a couple months ago and it was really, really helpful for me. Um, just consider you're at a bank. You're at a bank lobby, and you look over at one of the bank tellers, and a bank teller is handing a person an extremely huge wad of cash, okay? And you see that. Really, one of two things is happening. Somebody who is a legitimate customer of the bank is going into the bank and making just a very large withdrawal, and the bank teller is handing over a stack of money to that person. That is a possibility. But the other possibility is this. Somebody is standing there with a gun forcing that bank teller to hand over the wads of cash. So when you think about those two realities, here's, here's what we can think about. In both cases, the same physical act is happening. The handing over of a large amount of money. The same act is happening, but in the context of two very different narratives. And it's the narrative that determines the moral quality of that act. And it's the same when it comes to sex and sexuality. The same physical act can happen, but it depends on what narrative it's happening within that determines the moral quality of the act. The Bible teaches repeatedly that sexual activity is only healthy within the covenant of marriage. Marriage is meant to be the means by which we promise to give ourselves fully and exclusively to somebody else, vowing whole life commitment. It's the way that God has designed it. Jesus himself, he teaches that sexuality is, 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 uh, uh, is an evidence, or sexual immorality is an evidence that our heart is really not in the right place. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus would say these words. He would say, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, out of our heart. Our hearts are wrong. Our hearts are messed up. Our hearts are the problem. And what happens? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. We'll talk about that phrase in a minute. Theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands, which was the question he was addressing to the religious leaders, does not defile them. He says, our hearts are in a wrong place, and that's why we all experience sexual immorality. Now this phrase sexual immorality is actually one little Greek word and it's the word porneia. And that word is kind of it's where we get the English word pornography from, but it's it's a Greek word that is kind of a catch-all word for any sexual conduct outside of the covenant of marriage. 
including same, you know, sex before marriage, including adultery, prostitution, same-sex sexual behavior, all of those, it's like a catch-all word. Any activity, any sexual activity outside of the covenant union of a man and a woman. And, 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 and Jesus is saying it happens because our hearts are, are broken and there's something wrong with us. And so we need, we, we need to fix that thing that is wrong with us. Now, it's easy, I know, and I talk to people all the time, especially young people. It is easy to think that sex before marriage and sex within marriage, they're just essentially the same act. The only difference is timing. Many people make the, will make that argument. That, that it's no different, it's just timing. But it's not true. Because sex outside of the marriage vow is a different act than sex expressing and reinforcing vows that you've made to somebody. One is established, establishing a context of lifelong self-giving. The other is a form of taking. It's a form of theft. And all throughout scripture, the sexual ethic that Christianity puts forth is that the most healthy place, the place that is best for your soul, that is best for your whole entire being to engage in sexual activity is actually within the confines and within the covenant of marriage and anything outside of that it's a form of theft and when you steal from somebody you hurt them and you hurt you this is the christian sexual ethic now we don't have time to go into tons of, of detail as fascinating as they are but the the sexual ethic that christianity brought into the world um, it's, it's not just old-fashioned. A lot of people want to say, oh, you know, save sex for marriage. This is an old-fashioned idea. It's not old-fashioned. Because to say that the Christian sexual ethic is old-fashioned is to say that once upon a time in history, humanity's sensibilities matched the Christian sexual ethic. That's never been a reality. Okay? You go back all the way to the beginning of human history, people have not been like, yes, let's save sex for marriage. That's just not a reality. The Christian sexual ethic is not old-fashioned. It has always been completely countercultural and unprecedented to every culture that has ever existed. Now, the Christian sexual ethic has shaped and formed much of the West. And in fact, the Christian sexual ethic has brought three very important things into the world that did not exist prior to. And I think this is really important to note, how the Christian sexual ethic has actually influenced and made the world a better place. Let me share these three quick things with you. Number one, the Christian sexual ethic brought constraints on men. Constraints on men. The, the, the Christian sexual ethic imposed boundaries and controls for men, not just for women. Throughout human history, you read any civilization, any point in history, sexual ethics were built upon the notion that men had freedom to do whatever they want to satisfy their sexual desires any way that they pleased. After all, men's commitment and the consequences for a man are completely less than the consequences for a, a, a woman in the realm of sexuality. The Christian sexual ethic said, you know what? No, 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 no. Men cannot just do whatever they want. Men can just not live in CAD mode whenever they want. No, no, no. The, 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 the purpose of sex is to be in the union of marriage. And when it's placed in the union of marriage, it actually provides good and healthy constraints on men. And this was revolutionary, especially in the Roman world, if you've studied any uh, a part of Roman history. And it's still revolutionary today. Last week, I um, mentioned a book that has been um, really kind of mind-boggling for me. Uh, Louise Perry wrote a book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Again, I highly encourage you to read this book. But again, she's not, she's not religious at all. She is a British, British psychologist and counselor, and, and she has no connection to, she doesn't, she doesn't believe in Jesus. She is just writing from a sociological and a psychological standpoint. And in her book, she talks a lot about monogamy and about how we live in a culture that is against monogamous marriage, but she makes the argument that it's actually the best system for our world today. I want to read you a few quotes from uh, this chapter in her book. She said these things. But while the monogamous marriage model may be relatively unusual, and she was comparing it to when you look in nature, there's not, I mean, monogamy is not like something that you see all around us in nature and with, with animals. It's unusual. It is also spectacularly successful. When monogamy is imposed on a society, it tends to become richer. It has lower rates of both child abuse and domestic violence. Birth rates and crime rates both fall, which encourages economic development, and wealthy men deny the opportunity to devote their resources to acquiring more wives 
Instead, invest elsewhere in property, business, employees, and other productive endeavors. All of the studies show that a society that has strict guidelines imposed on monogamy are better societies to live in. And that's not a spiritual thing. This is just a sociological thing. She would go on and she would say this. A monogamous marriage system is successful in part because it pushes men away from CAD mode. Fatherhood, I found, found this fascinating, then has a further taming effect even at the biochemical level. Scientists have found this to be true in their studies. When men are involved in the care of their young children, their testosterone levels drop alongside their aggression and their sex drive. To which men by late, wait, that's not good. I don't want my sex drive and my testosterone to drop. But as we get older, when those levels drop in men, it's better for the world. And that actually needs to happen. And she goes on to say, a society composed of tamed men is a better society to live in for men, women, and for children. Duh. <laughs> But man, we have a society that says, no, go do whatever you want, take whatever you want, consume whatever you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody, but people are hurting everybody with it. One more thing that she said, I love this. She said the marriage system that prevailed in the West up until recently was not perfect. Nobody argues that it is. Nor was it easy for most people to conform since it demanded high levels of tolerance and self-control. But where the critics go wrong is in arguing that there is any better system. There isn't. Critics may go on and on about, about monogamous marriage and about the marriage system, about how terrible it is and how oppressive it is. But the problem is they can't offer anything better. And they haven't. Marriage actually... And through, through the Christian sexual ethic, it actually promotes constraints on men, which men need. Constraints on men. The second thing that Christian sexual ethic brought to the world of sexuality is mutuality. We've, we've already talked about this. First Corinthians talks about this all the time, that sex is a means of self-giving to one another. It's not about taking. And this was a radical view of sexuality because, again, all culture for all of time never really taught this about sexuality. And then thirdly, and probably the most important, Christianity, the, the sexual Christian ethic brought the concept of consent to the world. And, and, and consent, as we all know, is a value that Western society continues to assist upon, and rightly so. They might have taken it to far extremes, but rightly so. But consent, when it came to sex and sexuality, even when it came to marriage, is not the norm globally. There are parts of the, parts of the world where you cannot consent to being married. It was, the, it was Christianity that actually introduced the idea that it's good for you to choose to be married or choose not to be married. But much of the world that we live in still today, people are forced. Young girls as young as 14 are forced into marriages. The, the, the Christian sexual ethic brought the idea of consent to the world. And it was good. The Christian sexual ethic... That says sex is designed for the context of the covenant of marriage, introduced restraints on men, introduced mutuality, and introduced consent to the world. And I believe it's the best system. And it's the best system because it's God's system. And it's God's design. And God's way is always the best way. Let me, let me close with a few final thoughts of encouragement. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 11 says these words. I love this verse. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs. We live in a world searching for satisfaction, but they're just searching in all of the wrong places. God will actually satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Author Jefferson Bethke said this about sexuality. He said, sex outside of marriage, which is the Christian sexual ethic, one of them, is like an adult being satisfied swimming in the kiddie pool. God isn't a buzzkill. He actually wants to bring you into deeper waters. God's way is designed for our good. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will we trust God's way? Will we trust God's design? If you're here today and you are married, let me tell you two things. Number one, 
Know that your greatest satisfaction in life will come from your relationship with your heavenly father. Number two, enjoy sex with your spouse and enjoy it as a form of self-giving and as union. If you're here today and you are not married, let me tell you two things. Number one, your greatest satisfaction in life will come from your relationship with your heavenly father. And then number two, if you are having sex outside of marriage, you need to stop because it is hurting you. It is hurting your whole self. And it's hurting the whole self of the person you are sleeping with. If you're listening here today and you're like, man, I wish I knew this 15 years ago. Man, I wish, I wish somebody had said these things. Man, I have, I have messed up so much. I want you to know there is so much hope for all of us. Because all of us, guess what? We are all sexually broken. Every single one of us, we are sexually broken because we are broken people. Next week, we are going to see how the gospel actually lifts us out of our sexual brokenness and gives us a fresh start. The gospel brings re reconciliation even into that area of our life. And we hope you join us next week as we close out this series together. Let me close by praying with us and let's ask God uh, to continue to help us grow as we follow him faithfully. God, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we acknowledge today that we need you. We acknowledge today that we know that we are broken in so many areas of our life and, and we acknowledge today, God, I pray that our hearts truly can acknowledge today that your design and your way is best, that you know what is good for us, and you don't want to keep something from us, but you actually want something for us. So God, my prayer today is that we would trust in your will, we would trust in your design, and God, even though we all have fallen short of your will and your glory in our life, God, we know, we know that the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, is that we have redemption and we have reconciliation through you. God, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We pray all these things today in the name of Jesus. Amen.